My name is Phil Sorber, um, and I'm going to do a talk on Apache, Apache Traffic Server Internals. Um, the alternate title for this is How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love ATS, but I was told that at least two other people uh, stole that line uh, with a different ending. Um, but what I really wanted to do in this talk was uh, talk about the internals and show what's cool about ATS to get people excited about it and want to join our community. But I also wanted to show that um, it's a code base that's manageable and new people can contribute and make an impact right away. Um, and, I, and I also did this talk because this is what I wish I had when I started working on ATS. It was a bit overwhelming at first, so. What's that? Yeah. All right, so that's, that's, the, that's the tertiary title now. Um, a little bit about me, or maybe why you should listen to me. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Comcast, and I work on the IPCDN team. And if you were here earlier for Jan's talk, um, that's the group that I work with, and that's what we do. Um, I'm also a committer to ATS now uh, for about a year and a half. And sometimes people say I'm a generally cool guy, but I was told that I need a citation for that. So I don't know if we can, we might have to erase that bullet point from the slides before I upload them. What's that? I do not. I live here in Denver. Um, I probably wouldn't be working for Comcast if they made me live in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, I, did live in, I did live in Pennsylvania. I lived in Harrisburg, but uh, Philly was out of the question. Um, and so if that previous slide didn't convince you that, that you should stay here, um, hopefully this one will. Um, what I'm going to talk about in here is uh, things like CPU, memory, storage, network, some of the abstractions, and just how ATS works internally. I'm kind of going to go at kind of an intermediate level. I'm not going to dive real deep. Um, kind of want to get an overview of things, but a little bit deeper than just, you know, talking about caching. Um, so just in case you guys didn't know, uh, Apache Traffic Server is a caching proxy. Um, it's written primarily in C++. Uh, let's see. Um, also, I, I wasn't really sure how much detail to go into for the audience, how much you wanted to talk about. So if there's questions along the way, feel free to ask them. Um, give you a, a brief history about ATS. Um, it was started in, at Inktomi in the late 90s. I think there's some uh, difference of opinion on what year it started. I have 96 in my slides. Um, but then Inktomi was uh, acquired by Yahoo in 2002. Um, and they did a lot of stuff with it internally as well. Um, and if you were here for the previous talk, they talked about the history a lot as well. Um, and then it was open source to Apache in 2009 into the incubator. And then in 2010, it became a top level project. Um, what the point though that I'm trying to make with this slide is that it's had a very long history and had a lot of different groups of people working on it and then completely leaving, forklift leaving, new group coming in and work on, working on it and it did, it did that twice. So there's a bit of uh, code archeology span when it comes to working on ATS. So um, half the fun is getting in there and figuring out how things actually do work. Um, so first thing I wanna cover is how ATS deals with the CPU. Um, we are a multi-threaded application, but we are not uh, a thread per request or thread per connection or anything like that. It's uh, more like a thread pool. Um, and we're asynchronous and event driven. So we have uh, an event loop running in a thread that, does, that allows us to do asynchronous stuff. Uh, this is kind of like um, Nginx and Node.js and stuff like that. So we don't have a bunch of, con we don't have a bunch of context switches. Um, so it's more efficient that way. Um, we also use continuations, which are, um, they're essentially a callback handler with some state attached to it. So it's different than um, something like a coroutine, which would have to yield. Um, this one, it, it just gets called back. It's a bad description, but. Um, and the other thing that, that's really important for us is CPU affinity. So uh, when you're running on one CPU all the time and you have all the, all the clock cycles, you are not having to do, deal with context switches and it also helps you when you're dealing with memory. 
um, which I'll cover in, in a little bit later slide. So, so here is my depiction of an event loop. Um, essentially, you have something running in your continuation, and it registers an event and says, hey, I have a socket, whether it's a network socket, or you're doing some disk I.O., and it says, when there's data to be read on this, or yeah, data to be read on this, call me back, or when I can write data to this, call me back. And it goes into a pending event queue, and then some point in the future, um, the event fires. While it's sitting in the pending event queue, um, other continuations can run. So basically, continuations are interleaved. And then the event fires, and then it's runnable. Um, and so when there's a CPU to run it on, a thread to run it on, that continuation is called, and it runs the event handler again. And it basically repeats over and over going through a state machine. Um, any questions about any of this yet? All right. Um, so there's, when you're doing disk I.O., you have to have uh, asynchronous I.O. threads that are actually blocking, doing the blocking, because AIO um, is a little bit complicated, and, it, and you'll see stuff in like glibc documentation or something like that where it says, oh, you can do AIO, but it really spawns threads in the background. Um, and Linux kernel also theoretically has an AIO interface, but if you do the slightest thing wrong, it defaults back to threads. So uh, what ATS does in, in this case is we just have our own AIO thread, so we control the process, and then it's, uh, you know, when you control it, you can do things better for yourself. Yeah. I'd like to mention that uh, ATS likes to do uh, similar shell recursion, so if you have a continuation that deals with another continuation that you want to do relay, you'll call it in that rather than going back up to the rest of the control that we have. And uh, there is a project that we're doing in which that, that's what's going on. Yeah, and there, there is, it, it's not exactly this simple. Um, there's there's a, a couple, event loops, so to speak, in ATS, and we'd like to make that a little bit cleaner and simpler so that this picture does apply, but this is, this is the general idea. I'm going kind of fast here, so. Um, so I said before that ATS was multi-threaded. We have a bunch of different uh, thread types. Um, the main thread type is the net thread. That's where most of the good stuff happens. That's where when the connection comes in, um, you know, creates a, a state machine, a transaction, and uh, starts handling all the stuff, starts doing the cache lookups. Um, then we have AIO threads. So those are the ones that are actually doing the, the IO requests to the disk and blocking. Um, I believe right, the, the default right now is eight AIO threads per disk, per um, volume, and they spend most of their time blocking. Um, then we also have task threads. Task threads or when you want to do something, but it's not time critical, and maybe it's going to block for a little bit, um, that something that you just can't help like that. Um, so you might want to run it on a task thread instead of a net thread. If you block a net thread, then you start getting latency issues, and your requests start backing up and stuff like that. So we have task threads that are set aside specifically for that. Um, then we have accept threads. So we have two ways to do accept. We can do uh, blocking accept in um, an accept thread, so those threads actually sit there and block and only get woken up by the kernel uh, when there's an incoming connection, or we can do accept per net thread. And when we do accept per net thread, that's another event, um, another socket event on the net thread event loop. Um, there's some other uh, types of threads that are less common. Some people, you know, live and die by them, but they're not on by default, so SSL threads. I'm sure Yahoo, you guys use SSL threads, um, so that the SSL work can be pushed off to those to free up the net threads. Um, DNS threads, the same thing. Um, you can do all your DNS requests on DNS threads. Um, remap threads are a special case where when, you, when you're doing the loading of a remap file, and Leif might have to correct me on this, when you're, when you're loading a remap file, and processing all that, that happens on the remap thread so that you're not blocking a net thread when you're updating your remap config. Is that roughly right? I'm getting that look. No? My, my, I thought it was when you have a remap plugin, uh -huh. and the plugin actually gets executed on the remap thread. Oh, OK. So So, 
And is it every remap? I remember talking about this now. Is it every remap plugin that has to run there then? Yes, all the, all the, the enable that bootstrap is set up and then that's the, the lower, all the, okay. so, all the remap plugins like they, they fall on those three units there. Okay. So so there's there's plugins. I don't talk about plugins in here too much, but there's there's plugins in ATS and there's two plugin APIs. One of them is the regular API, and one of them is a remap API for doing um, re uh, reverse remap for uh, like a reverse proxy. And so what they're saying is those plugins would get run on those threads. So if you do something blocking in there, that they can block on those threads while the net threads continue to run. Um, also. The regular plugin API has some thread stuff where you can uh, pass it a, a, a function pointer and say, run this function on that thread until it exits. And it'll run it on a separate thread and then you can do uh, whatever you want. If you want to block on that thread, if you want to do a sleep for 60 seconds and then freeze some memory or something like that, um, you would do that on those threads. Right. Memory. Um, so, ATS does a lot of fun stuff with memory. Memory is, uh, being fast is really important because uh, CPUs are so fast these days that uh, most of the time that's wasted is, is stalls on the CPU waiting for memory. So, um, the stuff we do in here in this area is really important. Um, one of the things that we have is a RAM, uh, RAM cache. And this is not a RAM disk, this is actually um, a RAM cache per storage device where when you have a hot, something that's hot, an object that's hot, it gets stored in RAM cache and served directly out of RAM so you don't have to do disk I.O. So disk I.O. is even worse than, than memory I.O. as far as uh, stalling the CPU. Um, also, doing things with NUMA is very important. You guys remember the NUMA NUMA guy? No? I wanted to put the video in here, but I figured I'd get in trouble for something copyrighted or something. But uh, yeah, so keeping, keeping the, um, the memory close to the thread that's going to use it on that same NUMA node is very important. Um, and then there's memory management. And ATS uses free lists for that. Um, so the, the free list, essentially, when we allocate memory from the operating system, we don't ever give it back. We just keep it uh, and we track it in a free list. And then when something needs it again, we pull it out of the free list. Um, there's a couple kinds that we have. Um, start off with the allocators, which is essentially a C++ wrapper of the free list. So you just say, I want to block a memory this size, and it, it'll give you that. And then there's the class allocators. Um, the class allocators, I think, are pretty ingenious. They have an instance of the class of the type they are, so that they're like a C++ template. And they have an instance of that class inside them. So when you say, hey, I want a, uh, you know, an HTTP state machine, it, takes, it finds a block of memory on the free list, and then it does a mem copy of that instance that it has over the block of memory that it's going to give you, and then it hands it off. So you don't have to do uh, like a in-place initialization or anything like that. It just directly copies it. Um, something else to note about the class allocators is they're global. Um, so there's, we have multiple threads accessing them. So it's, uh, the concurrency is put in check by atomic operators. Um, I'll actually go into the, the free list and the atomic operators a little bit more in, another, in the next slide. Um, we also have proxy allocators, which are essentially class allocators, except they're per thread. And since they're per thread, um, we don't have to have any locks on them or any atomics. Um, they're always set to, one, to that one particular thread. Um, and the proxy allocators get their memory from the class allocators. So the class allocator will allocate, say, 128 chunks of memory all of a certain size for your class. And then when the proxy allocators need memory, they just go to the class allocators. And then inside the thread, the thread uses the proxy allocator and it's much faster. Um, the other one is arenas. And I think arenas are pretty cool. Um, basically, we give one, one arena to every transaction and then that transaction can allocate memory for itself and not have to worry about the cleanup that block of memory is just passed along through the whole state machine with that transaction. And then at the end, when the transaction um, is done, it, the transaction goes back on the free list, but the arena is cleared as well. So that goes on a different free list. Actually, I think that's where the allocators are for. Um, and also, huge pages. So 
Um, right now, we don't use huge pages directly. There was uh, kind of a bug, big bug that we ran into at Comcast recently where Linux is trying to make you use huge pages without you seeing them, and some of the stuff it does in the background um, causes ATS to lock up for minutes. So um, huge pages are something I'd like to see put into ATS in the very near future. And to give you a little background on huge pages, it's a, it's a Linux feature. Um, other operating systems have similar things, but uh, basically, rather than allocating your memory in like 4K or 2K chunks, it does it in two megs or four megs, depending on your architecture. They also have ones that are um, one gigabyte in size, and this lowers your uh, TLB pressure. The TLB is basically your cache for virtual memory lookups. So when you have to do, when you, when you, your continuation that's running on your CPU needs to go get memory, and that memory, that page isn't in the TLB, it has to go out and get that page and bring it into the virtual memory space and all that other fun stuff. So when you can have bigger pages in memory, you have fewer of those entries, so you can have more, basically more physical memory mapped into virtual memory at once. All right, this is, is basically what the free list looks like. There's a couple other variables just stating how big that these chunks should be and how uh, many of them you want to get at once, but essentially this is the free list, and it's a, a linked list stack. So we have the head pointer, um, and these, this next pointer, basically this, when, when it's inside the free list, this whole block of memory is a void star. So the next pointer is really the beginning of that memory space. But since we're going to copy over it when we free it, for, or when we remove it from the free list, it doesn't matter that we're using that space. So there's no um, extra data that we need to have around, no extra structures that we need to have to point at these. Um, I believe it's called an intrusive container, something like that. Yes. When it goes on the free list? Yes. Yeah, so, so what he's saying is that the, um, the uh, virtual function table pointer is usually at the top, and since it's being overwritten, um, when you try and call a method on it, it should crash, or you would hope it would. Um, I know... Right. Right. So any vir any virtual method that you've done, and and that's that's yeah. When you have with null, right? We, with the, we call it on null. So so yeah, that's something that if anybody has any great ideas, I know uh, this guy right up here front, Brian Geffen, is looking to figure out how we can make sure that you're not using memory on the free list. It is a um, a problem, and you know with multi-threaded things. So. Um, so yeah, over here we also have this version pointer. So each one of these pointers is 64 bits in size, and so the head in the version is 128 bits. And the reason for the version is uh, to solve the ABA problem. Basically, if you pop this guy off and this guy off and then put this guy back on, um, your, your head pointer will be the same, pointing to this guy here, but when he thinks he needs to do the compare and swap, he's gonna end up pointing at this guy instead of this guy when he was freed. So the version gets incremented every time. And we do that with a 128-bit compare and swap that, again, Brian Geffen graced us with. So um, that's basically the free list. Any questions about that? I think this is pretty cool, too. No? Okay. Continue on. So before I was talking about uh, NUMA, and I wanted to just explain real quick exactly what that meant. So. This is a, a modern architecture. This is probably you know, an Intel QPI bus, and you have your two sockets. Um, and back in the day, you would have your south bridge with your memory controller on your south bridge, and it was a shared bus to all that memory. And they said, well, that's really slow. So we're gonna put our memory controller with the socket, with the CPU on the die, so that you have direct access to it, and you don't have to share it over a bus. Um, but this causes a problem now when you have a thread running over here, and it wants to access this memory, it now has the added latency of going over this QPI bus. So the, the concept is that when you have your, you keep your threads that you start over here, that are allocating memory over here, stay running here, and that memory stays here. Um, and also, that huge page problem I was mentioning before, 
the transparent heat pages, Linux was trying to move memory from this side to this side, and when that's happening, your processes can't touch it, because it's not really where it's supposed to be. Um, and also the proxy allocators, when you're, when you're dealing with NUMA and your threads, they're, they're getting all their memory from the same side and they don't have to worry about dealing with other threads on this same socket trying to access their memory. So there's no locking there. Okay. Storage. Um, I don't know if it, how many of you guys were in here two talks ago for Alan's great storage talk. Um, but I'm gonna do kind of a, a higher level than what he went into. So um, ATS prefers to use raw devices. You can use uh, a file, but um, then you're adding file system overhead on top of writing out since we basically have our own file system layout, our own disk layout within uh, ATS, within the cache. Um, and, each store, and since you're using raw devices, you don't wanna do things like RAID. You wanna have each device addressed independently and you basically end up with unique caches. So um, if you lose a disk, you don't lose all your data, you just lose anything that was mapped to that one drive. Um, with each of those unique caches on each disk, you also get a unique RAM cache. So when we talk about the RAM cache, it sounds like a big cloud of memory, but it's actually a bunch of little clouds of memory. Um, and all this is done using consistent hashing, so when you have an object stored on a disk, it's always gonna be in the same one, so when you do lookups, it goes back to the same disk. And if you have to remove a disk, um, you don't reorder everything. And um, also, our, our on-disk format is a, a circular cache. It's optimized for spinning disk, which was the only option back in the late 90s when this was written, but um, it makes it very easy to use cheap spinning disks uh, in ATS rather than having to spend the money on SSDs. So you get a lot more bang for your buck there. Here's a diagram of some storage. So you can see here, um, we have all our volumes. The name, um, these, are, these are, I'm calling them volumes here and in some of the configs they're referred to as volumes, but in Alan's talk he referred to them as spans and maybe some other things depending on how they were configured. But just to keep it simple, I'm gonna refer to these as volumes. So these are each separate physical disks. They each have their own RAM cache, so when, um, when you request an object and ATS has to go back to the origin or to a parent, um, it'll be written onto the disk and served to the client at the same time. But the next time you come in and it says, oh, I have that on disk, then it also copies that to RAM cache. So there's a two lookup cost there to get it into RAM cache. Um, I think you can also extend that with an option, a filter option to make sure that you're not um, thrashing your RAM cache. Um, by, by looking up a whole bunch of different things. It'll, it'll keep it for hot items. And our RAM caches, um, while the, while the on-disk format is a circular and it just kind of overwrites old data as it's going through, the RAM caches can be LRU or um, this other kind of uh, uh, conglomeration of, of algorithms that we, I think it's called CFLUS. So I don't go quite into that algorithm, but a very smart guy came up with it and wrote it. Unfortunately, he's not here today. Um, and so the consistent hash, and I'll explain that real quick too. Uh, basically, some identifier for each device is hashed and, and converted to basically a numeric value. And then when you go to look up an object, that's, that object identifier uh, is also hashed. And then you try and find the one that has the closest proximity to the value of this. So that way, if you have to remove a volume, the only ones that change are the ones that were closest to this guy because all the other ones still continue to match. So if you just did a regular hash with like a, um, a modulo, everything would get reordered and you'd, and you'd basically have uh, one over n things not being, or one over n things not being recached, which would kill your, your uh, hit ratio. Um, and then if you add, if you actually, the contrapositive there is if you add a disk back in, um, some of the things that were previously being hashed to these other guys are now gonna be closer with the consistent hash to volume four. And so, while well, even though you might have them cached on the other volumes, they're no longer accessible, and so they'll have to be recached. Um, each of these volumes also has its own directory, which is essentially an index, 
and it's 10 bytes per object, which is very efficient. And if you were here for Brian's talk, uh, you'd know that that's uh, pretty much the smallest one across all the major open source caches. Um, and also the whole, the whole system with the directory and the on-disk format is crash-proof. So it's not, uh, I'll say it uses database-like uh, mechanisms. So an object is written to the cache first and then it's updated in the directory once it's on disk. And since everything is direct I.O., you don't have to worry about uh, file system caching. Um, and then when the index is written out every couple of seconds, there's two copies on each volume. So the oldest one gets overwritten and then when it's completely written out, a pointer gets switched, an on-disk pointer gets switched to point to that one. So at next restart, that copy of the directory is uh, loaded off disk. And if you have a power failure in the middle of a directory write-out or an object write-out, you're still consistent. Okay. Uh, network. There's not a whole lot of stuff you can do with the network, but some of the things that we do are connection pools. Um, we have global connection pools, or we can also do uh, per-thread connection pools. Um, again, doing it per thread so you don't have to deal with the locking makes it more efficient. Um, and we can, there's the concept of tiered caches where you have uh, an edge cache talking to a mid so that if you can get a 90% cache hit ratio or 90% offload from your edges and you can get a 90% hit rate from your mids, that means you're getting a 99% offload from your origins, in theory. Excuse me. <coughs> um, and also, we have the concept of parent selection. So instead of always having um, one mid-cache that you would go to, you can have several to select from. Um, and this can help with things like um, content affinity. So if you have a cluster of caches, you don't have to basically be duplicating your data across them. You can use uh, like a um, consistent hash to always go to the same mid for the same content. So here's a diagram of, of the tiered caching. Um, have your origin up here, and I try to make these lines a little thicker and a little different color to show that you would have multiple connections from one edge to one mid. Um, you know, if you had 32 threads running on here and you had per thread session pools, you would have 32 connections going up there. Um, also, if you were querying stuff from the same mid for the same content, um, you might end up with a couple connections because you can't multiplex uh, in HTTP 1.1. That theoretically in two you can and we're talking about how we're gonna do HTTP 2.0. So, um, yeah. Any questions on this? Uh, one other thing I want to point out, um, since these connections here are persistent and these connections here are persistent, if you have this really close to you in some geographic area like Denver and this mid is in, I don't know, Chicago or something like that, um, since these connections are always persistent, when you're doing your TCP handshake, you're only dealing with the latency of the round trip here and not having to deal with it all, going all the way to the origin. So it allows for faster connections, connection setup. Um, and in this version of the diagram, I just have it, uh, them both connecting to both mids so you can see what the parent, uh, what it might look like with uh, consistent hash parent selection. Questions? I guess you guys all know about tiered caching. Um, all right, this is the last section, is uh, all the wonderful abstractions that we have. So on top of all the wonderful things we do, on, with the CPU and the memory um, and the network, we have these abstractions that we put on top. So we have our processors. These are kind of related back to like the, um, the thread types that we had before. So we have a net processor, and basically that sets up the, the thread pool for the net, and it's also responsible for scheduling the continuation. So essentially, this is where the uh, event loops live. Um, and there's several different kinds. There's host DB, which is for uh, caching DNS requests. Then there's the DNS one for actually doing the lookups. There's the net, which we talked about already, SSL, um, cache. So all the cache lookups and all that happens on the cache processor. Um, and then remaps. But you won't, when you won't always have all these thread types. So for instance, you always have DNS, but you don't always have DNS threads. Um, they actually fall back to running on 
the net processor threads. Um, we also have state machines. State machines are very important. So the processors are, are what's going to run the continuations and move things through, but state machines are tracking where you are um, in the transaction. So you know when you have when you have a connection, then you need to do a DNS lookup on the origin, then you need to do a cache lookup, and so on and so forth. And in between all those distinct events, there's what would normally be blocking time. So when you're doing a DNS lookup, you'd request the DNS server, and in a normal application, you might just sit there and wait until the DNS server returned back to you. But what we'll do is say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna wait for um, an event on this network socket, call us back when we're good, and we'll set the state so that when we come back from the, con when, when we come back from the event loop, we'll know where we are. Um, I, have a, I have another picture about that on the next slide, too. Also, um, we do clustering, which is, I'm not sure it's really an abstraction, but I thought it was very important to talk about. Um, so you can put several ATS instances together and cluster them, and then if you have an incoming connection to one and it doesn't have the content, it'll look it up on the other ones and pass it back through. Um, so basically, they look like one giant ATS cache. Um, it, it does add state, so you might not want to use it, depends on your use case, but it exists. Um, I, I, I believe there's only one, there's one group that I know of that uses it heavily, um, and I don't know if they're even using it anymore. Do you have a question over here? No, okay. Um, so here's, I stole this from the documentation. It's actually about um, API hooks, but it also shows the state, so that's why I wanted to show it here. So, um, so you, you know, you have an accept here, and then you want to read through the request header and decide what you want to do. You have the, the OS DNS lookup, and that's where you would say, okay, I'm going to put this uh, event in the event loop to, to when I get the DNS information back, and then I'll let some other continuation run. And then when it comes back, we do the cache lookup. And then I say, oh, there's I.O. involved, so I'm going to send this I.O. request to the A.I.O. threads. Um, you know, I want to get, I want to see if this is in there, or get it off disk. And then you do, again, you, you register your event, and you go, basically go to sleep while some other continuations run on the event loop. So they're all interleaved like that, and it, it, there's no context switching, but you're switching in the transaction state. Any questions on that? You guys are so quiet. You're moving too fast. You guys want to get to beer. I know I'm the last talk of the day. That's what this is really about. I'll buy somebody a beer if they have a question. All right. <laughs> all right, well, that's, that's all I got. So um, if you want to contact me, there's my email address, Twitter. There's a, this is where you can get the software and all kinds of other documentation that we have there. And if you have questions, um, we hang out in Pound Traffic Server on Freenode. I'm PSU Damon there. And all these guys right here in this row, and this guy here, and some other guys around, floating around, maybe back there, will be there to answer your questions as well. So nothing else. Let's go get some beer. Or let's go to the keynotes and then go get some beer. So, so just to repeat what Alan's saying. Um, documentation is a really easy thing to work on. So if this looks interesting and you don't think you can contribute to the code right away because it's complex and you want to learn it better, you can at least come find all these things that I did wrong in this presentation and go back and correct them in the documentation. So. Nothing else? Oh, wait, wait. Yes. From from locking for the. You want to just say that in the mic? Because <laughs> I didn't really understand that.
Right. The more benchmark connections would be on the same. Right. Okay, and so, and, and so that kind of goes back to, um, not really to NUMA, but kind of having the same, um, everything together in one thread. So you want to have, kind of have a transaction, hit one thread, and stay in that one thread for its lifetime. Although, I must say, the global thread pool seems to be safer to use for certain things, because I've seen a lot of crashes. We should get the microphone so we can like uh, we can hear that. So I don't have to repeat all that. But and Eric's trying to sl start the slow clap back there. <laughs> all right. No, Alan has Alan wants more beer. Yeah, I will buy you a beer. I'm not going to defer your beers to anybody else. So. So if you want a beer and I will sit there and watch you drink it, then we'll do that. But otherwise, uh, sorry. Non-transferable. So the al so I agree that the, the plugins are limited and need work um, and and. Yes, I can. He, he was making the comment that uh, he thought that the plugin APIs uh, were a little limited, that, that all these wonderful things that I just talked about, you didn't have access to all of them. For instance, the free lists, the allocators. Um, and we are, we're currently in the process of working on our 5.0 release, so we're allowed to break APIs right now. And so Leif is hard at work on breaking everything he can and getting us to fix it for him. And and one of the tickets that he has open actually for me is to have the plugin API have access to free lists. Um, and there's some discussion on how to do that. So So Alan is saying that he wants to add a lot of the network, the internal network um, uh, helpers um, into the plugin API. And I also know that he wants to add a lot of cache stuff to the plugin API based on his talk two talks ago that I know you were all here for as well, because you love ATS that much. So, what are my two magic words, Eric? You're supposed to be thanking me. I'm the one who gave you the information. Just kidding. Thank you all for coming.